Good evening. On behalf of the Office of Career Services, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to our annual Youth Motivation Task Force program. This is a special moment for a premier program that has consistently motivated students to excel for 45 years. A program that has been sponsored by business and government agencies, a program where some consultants have paid out of their pockets to participate and taken time off from their jobs. Some have invested hours to prepare. A program that has touched, that has touched the lives of thousands of students from AMNN and UAPB. A program that has provided opportunities for summer internships, cooperative education, and per permanent jobs. A program that has touched the lives of over a thousand high school students. A program that has made major moves and that has brought alumni and friends together to make a major impact. I'm excited. I am thankful. I'm so grateful. Because without you, consultants, and you, the students, this would not be possible. Students, please stand and join me by giving the consultants a round of applause. <laughs> consultants, please stand with me and give our students a round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Branch. <laughs> Again, I welcome each of you. And I should have heard some applause when I said 45 years. Come on. That's a long time. And we have not missed one year putting on this program. So that is very commendable for this university. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. That's better. So how did you guys like, like the networking session? It was good. Awesome. As you guys know, our theme is making major moves. And guess what? Networking is making a major move. So give your hands a round of applause again. We all know that networking, we use it related to trying to find a job, but we all know that networking is everyday life. You're getting to know people, trying to figure out their commonalities, and as you guys were going around, you were asking, where are you from? How many siblings do you have? Where do you work? And some of the things we had in common. So continue to network, because it can help you out in your life. Just a prime example, I was coming from West Holiness to the YMTS program today. I was speeding. Got a ticket. Of course, the officer said, where are you from? I was like, from West Helena. He's like, oh, I'm going to give you a break today because I'm from West Helena. Networking. <laughs> I said, thank you, because I did not want to get a ticket. I was going 47 and a 35. You know how it is when you're coming through Wapasika and they get you. Uh, now, they were trying to make a major money move. <laughs> but my networking kept me out of that. But as you go through life and you try to network for a job, I want you guys to keep in mind for three objectives. You need to make sure that your focus, that you have a clear focus and direction. And the objective that you need to keep in mind when you're speaking of finding a job is make others aware of your job search. Increase your knowledge about a particular career field and then find out more about potential employers. If you can do those three things, then the person that you're networking with would know what your goals are. So make sure you keep your goals clear, have a clear focus and direction. And also, you have to know the law of 250. How many of y'all know what that is? The law of 250 is everybody in this room knows at least 250 people. I'm sure if you pull out your phone right now and go through your contacts, you have at least 250 people in that telephone. And that is your first networking tool. And guess what? 
Each one of those persons in your directory, in your contact list, knows 250 people. Now, when you're looking for a job, your initial people within your contact list may not be the ones to get you the job, but they may know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Then you're land that job. So make sure you go through your contacts and add at least, I think we have how many consultants this year? 41? 40-ish? 40-ish? So before we leave here this week, we leave it on Wednesday, so I'm going to leave it on Tuesday, at least add 10 contacts to your list from the consultants. Because we may know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody in your field that you can get a job. So we are here to help you. And also, when you get those contacts, you may ask yourself, what do I ask them? You know, just be general about it. Be yourself. And then one thing you can ask them, just may I ask some, may I ask some advice from you? And when you ask them, they say, yes, you can. You say, well, what are some of the top employees in my field that I should apply for? They may not know, but they may know somebody that knows. And that is the key to networking, because you want to know the people that know. And then also, always have a 10-second bite. When you speak to someone, you need to know what you want and what you are asking for. And to do that, you have two things. You say, I have dot, 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 and I am looking for. So you would say, I am a physics major. Well, let me back up. You would say, I have experience in physics, and I'm looking for an internship or co-op in that field. <coughs> Or you say, I have experience in computer science, and I'm looking for a job in computer science with IBM, Google, or whoever. Be specific. You have those 10 second bite, then that's going to develop a conversation. So you need to make sure that you do that. I have dot, 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 and I'm looking for dot, dot, dot. Because networking is a two-way street. So when you do make those contacts with the consultants this week, make sure that you are real about it and you are true and you really want to get further in your education or get further in your career. Because when we take on you guys, it's our reputation. So if you say you want a co-op position and we go out our way to get you that co-op position and you get there and you don't produce, then we're going to look bad. So make sure, I know you millennials are not good about no's, but I'm going to give you four no's that you need to know today. And the four no's is the K-N-O-W. First, know yourself. Secondly, know your professors, know these consultants, and know your subject matter. Know what you want, and know what's ahead. If you can know those things, then you will be very, very successful in your career. Because know that networking is a major move. And you are at an HBCU. And I have changed the acronym to HBCU. HBCU stands for Helping Blacks Compete Universally. And that's what HBCU stands for. Come on, everybody. Give Dr. Jones a great hand. One of the beauties of following Dr. Jones is I could really just say uh, ditto and sit down. Uh, but what I'll try to do, because I'm truly grateful to be here with you today uh, from Houston, uh, I'll try to follow what they call uh, the three Bs, which is to uh, be sincere, uh, be brief, and then quickly be seated. So hold, hold me to that and see how it works out. But I want to just share just some of my story and experience because I can recall the first time that I was officially introduced to the concept of networking. Uh, I was a mid-level manager at a company, and I was attending an executive uh, leadership conference. And I was sitting there, and this gentleman by the name of George Frazier, not the boxer, this is a guy who was a senior executive at Xerox and did some phenomenal things, and now he's promoting financial literacy and empowerment in our communities. But, but George was speaking, and he was speaking across a very diverse group. I mean, you had people from the uh, technology uh, arena, you had oil and gas, you had the financial industry, medical industry. These are all various executives at their company. And he asked the question in the midst of his presentation. He said, what's the most valuable asset that you can have in this new millennium? And he paused, and then he asked again, what's the most valuable asset 
that you can have in this new millennium. Now, you've got some very smart people in this room, and, and again, I gave you the industry, so people were shouting out, you know, oil, gas, gold, uh, the internet, uh, my financial portfolio, my company's network. And he listened attentively, and then he interjected, he said, the most valuable asset you can have in this new millennium is your network of relationships. And I'll say it again, your network of relationships. And what he's really saying is that as a function of you going out and engaging, it's your social capital, not necessarily your financial capital, but your social capital, that really defines your trajectory in terms of your career. Uh, I can recall uh, one of my uh, mentors, uh, he would always say to me, he said, uh, hey Otto, it's, it's about cultivating relationships and not just about what you can get out of the relationship. It's about just not talking about yourself, but it's again, it's about being genuine. And you heard Dr. Jones reference that, being authentic as you go up and talk to people. It's about being a good listener. It's about being able to articulate your value proposition as a part of that conversation. You know, I mentioned this quote, and I can think of it as Dale Carnegie, but Dale Carnegie would say, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can do in two years by trying to get other people to become interested in you. Mm -hmm. And so what he's saying, you know, as you go out and engage with individuals, try to get to know them. You would be amazed at the opportunity that people are looking for to help someone else. They just need someone to come and engage them in a very genuine and authentic way. I'll give some pointers here real quick because I know we're tight on time, and, uh, but I just want to go through a couple of lists of items to share with you around networks. One of those would be, you know, I tell people that I'm mentoring and coaching, I said, you should develop your networks before you need them. Uh, I sit with colleagues who are going through transitioning jobs and they call me up and say, I want to get into the legal field, I want to do this. Um, and they are probably mid-year, maybe near the end. And, and maybe someone would say, yeah, you, you should have been developing your networks long before you actually needed to tap into it to, to use it. Uh, another suggestion for you is, and again, unfortunately, at least for me, I said, I wish I would have known now, well, I guess I wish I'd known earlier at this point that someone shared with me probably about 10 years ago. And as I was going through this path of networking, he said, you should consider developing your own personal board of directors. And this is a function of basically looking at your network and saying, who are those individuals in my network that I can tap into to give me counsel, to give me advice, to help me talk through and work through challenges that I may have, conflicts that I may have. And so, as I say, I, I wish I would have known this or I had come up with this or someone shared with this at the early part of my career, but I'm sharing it with you to do what you may. Uh, but it, for me, it has worked out wonders. I, I'll go through a quick list here again, because I know we're tight on time, but I'll just say, recognize it effective because, I mean, everybody can network. And I tell people you can go out and collect business cards, but we're talking about effective networking isn't easy. It takes effort, it takes sincerity, it takes time. Another point, take advantage of your professional organizations. You have plenty of them here on campus. Take advantage of that. And not only the professional organizations, I mean, look around here at your fellow students and look at them as potential network opportunities. Because they have, I think as Dr. Jones says, you know, their list of 250 or so. Tap into that, develop that. Leverage the wealth of knowledge and networks you have right here on the campus. And I'm talking about your professors. I can't, I, I can't count the number of times that I talk to students and none of them have engaged their professors beyond just the specifics of their class. And your professors have a wealth of networks themselves. Tap into that. Focus on quality of your connections, not quantity. Take advantage of your internships. And I, when I say that, I'm just saying, take them seriously. Reach out to your alumni. Leverage social media. I'm not saying posting, but I mean, look at LinkedIn as an opportunity to develop and connect with people, and then cultivate those connections. Look at the Twitter and these, and if there's companies that you're interested in, start following them so that you can be apprised and updated around what's going on in their companies, and who just made a, a major move in a company, what business did they just acquire. 
Uh, of course, take advantage of this year's YMTF program and the network of your visiting consultants. And by all means, by all means, leverage your Office of Career Services. Remember, networking is finding, developing, and nurturing relationships in a manner that is mutually beneficial. And I'll just end by saying, and I truly believe, and there are several books about this, I truly believe that your, that networks, your networks define ultimately your net worth. Thank you. Okay, at this time, do we have one student that would like to share your networking experience this afternoon? One student. Hello, everyone. My name is Julissa Brown. I'm an English major here, and tonight I networked with um, about like seven people, and they were each interested in their own way. I met someone from NASA, and that's the biggest thing. Like, wow, amazing. <laughs> I'm still in awe. Um, I actually talked to someone that I recognized from last year that probably didn't get to know me. He was really like, he was really bubbly, really um, interested in what I was doing. And then the last person that I met actually gave me tips on a certain career field that I could be interested in. And he shared his experience on the yard with me, which I can't wait to hear the rest of. Um, it was just a good opportunity. I met a lot of people. Um, and each one had something different going on, and most of them started here at UAPB or another HBCU. Just great. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Giles Willis Jr. I am. I serve daily at Willis Family Dentistry as a dentist. Um, when I was asked to do this charge, I was told to keep it at five ten minutes, but. Um, Ms. Cherry, never seen me with a mic in my hand before. Um, however, anyone who knows me knows that I like to talk and I like to probably be bubbly. She probably is talking about me. So allow me to begin by offering a few words from Dr. Eric Thomas, who's a national motivational speaker. Dr. Thomas says, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. Now, isn't this true? I mean, we're all gathered here today. Um, we're not here because we're the smartest in our class or we're the brightest in my class, but we're here simply because we had a why. A why that kept us pushing towards success. Our paths to success were filled with many challenges. For many of us, our achievements did not come suddenly. And what makes this moment so sweet is that we are here today to offer some young minds the same push that we received. The kind of push that helps students distinguish between making a wish and having a dream. Dr. King had a dream. There's a vast difference. I'm going to tell you two differences. You see, dreamers, they design their ideal life and work to achieve it every day. They don't believe in chance or luck. Wishers, wishers, they wait on the genie to come. They wait on the genie to come and give them three wishes. And the problem with that is, if they got these three wishes, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Okay? I'm living proof of dreams. I'm cultivated. My dreams come true. I'm going to share one quick story that I'm going to leave. I grew up in a country town, Louisville, Arkansas. Don't know if anybody knows where that is. 1,200 people in my town, 30 people in my high school class. Um, Tessie Brown, who was a 1986 graduate, was my biology teacher, my chemistry teacher there. My peer counselor brought me in and told me about all these scholarships that I had in Arkansas. Told me I had scholarships to SAU, to Henderson, to OBU. I mean, plenty, plenty of scholarships. Um, he did not tell me about my scholarship to UAPP. So I went back to talk to Tessie Brown, telling her about you know, the scholarships that I had, and she said, what about the scholarship to UAPB? And I said, what scholarship to UAPB? She said, uh, the one that they want to come and give you in like a couple of weeks. I said, I'll be right back. So I went back to my counselor and I said, can you go through those scholarships again you know, and tell me which ones I had? He went through the same ones again. Didn't tell me about UAPB. So I said to him, I said, uh, what about my scholarship to UAPB? He said, uh, oh, I didn't tell you about that? I said, uh, no, sir. He said, well, don't you want to be a dentist? I said, yeah, I've been wanting to be a dentist since I was in second grade. He said, well, I don't believe that you would get the educational background you need at that school to become a dentist. That school is what he said. So anybody that knows me know that I came to UAPB. And I doubled down, and I went to Howard University, so I graduated not from one HBCU, but from two HBCUs. <laughs> oh, I wish you could see this room right now. I really wish you could. Um, as I close this story, 
I want to add that these collective works of these HBCUs that I went to, the grit and the faith that I had in myself, and by the grace of God, I'm here today. Now, I know you guys don't actually need a motivational speech. I mean, I was asked to do a charge. Um, the fact that everyone is here during the time, I mean, that says a lot. Time is the most precious thing you can give. Dr. Ruth said last year, she, every class, she would say, how many seconds would you say in the thing? She asked every student, if I gave you $860,000 a, a day and you had to spend it, could you do it? That was profound to me. So if you need a charge, I'll charge you today to make your mark. Not just your mark in a professional arena, but make your mark and leave it an irreversible imprint on some type of student today. Um, each year that I'm here, I come away with something from someone because the UNPB family continues to leave its mark upon my life. This is my third year here. My first year here, Felicia Kennedy. Where are you at, Ms. Felicia? She was my team lead. This woman was amazing. She's been doing it for how many years now? You would think that she had been doing it for her first year. She was amazing. My second year, I had Dr. Ruth Jones as my team lead. <laughs> PhD. Now, okay, it's hard to follow both of them. I'm Ricky, I know you're my team lead this year. <laughs> So as I close here today, allow me, oh, I can forget somebody, my Kamisha. She's the reason that I met YMTF. She came to show you Kamisha. A fifth year, after her first year, she called me, called me, Giles, you got to do YMTF. These people need you. Giles, you got a story to tell. Giles, you got a story to tell. I can't come, Kamisha. It's on Monday and Tuesday. I can't come. I got my own business. I've been coming for three years, and I'm going to continue to keep coming, hopefully for 20 years. So I'm going to leave you with this. In a few years from now, I hope that there's a UNDB alum that's standing here that will come back. I hope it's somebody that's sitting here now that can say that the UNDB family has changed my life in some way. Because someone from this family left their mark upon my life. So leaving this moment in power, please leave your mark. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Joe Cockshell. Uh, I'm a May 2010 graduate of UAPB, uh, Business Administration with a concentration in marketing. Uh, my uh, the opportunity I have now is to give a student charge. So what I hope that you take away from the discussion today is that when we talk about making major moves, understand that that comes with a strategy, right? So you've heard a lot of different points about how to do this, what to avoid, this is a lot of information that people pay consultants a lot of money to give them this information. And you're getting access to people who are sincerely, uh, sincerely uh, focused on your success, they're investing and they care. And I can tell you now that once you leave this comfort and get, it out, get out into the real world, to find these type of people every day will be very difficult. So as Dr. Jones communicated, to find those 10 people, like really take that to heart. Because when you think about making major moves, that definition of what that means could completely change depending on your networking circle. So as I think back when I came here with a do-rag and a dream, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I consider Ms. Cherry my UAP, UAPB mom, you know, so, when I came, I was like, hey, I'm going to come to UAPB. You know, I'm from Little Rock. I'll go down here, do my thing. You know, make a lot of money. That's like, hey, what do you want to do? You're like, you want to make a lot of money, right? So when you start interacting with people who have been successful, you, you understand what that measurement of success really is, right? So you have to take the time now, you know, while you're in the university to really identify what that measurement of success is. And as a student, find you a mentor and an advocate. And there is a difference between those two individuals, right? So when you're networking, network with a purpose to identify a mentor and an advocate. And make sure that you allow those individuals to understand what do they benefit from sharing that information with you, for giving you that time. It's an opportunity to sell yourself, to say, hey, by you helping me, I will provide this back to you. And that may be something as simple as, hey, I'm going to thank you. I'm going to keep in contact with you on a quarterly basis. 
hey, if there's anything I can do, if, you, if they have a nonprofit organization that they support, you know, be willing to uh, help in community service. Definitely make sure that it's a two-way stream because it is a relation, relationship building aspect. And another thing with networking is collaboration, right? So even if you're interacting with people who may not be directly tied to your field, that can still be a great opportunity to learn, right? As we've all stated, everybody knows somebody else and somebody else knows somebody else. And the thing is, is that the relationships that you have now, you never know when those relationships are gonna come back. People change companies, people come up with new ideas, people create organizations. And if you are a person that they've had that relationship with as a student, and they see that you have the trajectory through this program, you, I mean, you have people that are willing to help you long term, you know, and, and people that are really, really care. And that's a, a significant matter. So when I think about when I came here, and I tell you about Ms. Cherry. So Ms. Cherry told me I could interview. And I had an opportunity, so as a freshman, uh, I had an opportunity to, to interview with a, a number of different companies, right, through YMTL. So I was a student. And when I saw the consultants, I was like, that'll be me in a couple of years. Like, I want to come back as a consultant. And I remember as a YMTL of my freshman year, uh, I was talking to everybody. I mean, I was a networking gadget. I was just everybody. And uh, I had an opportunity to, I can't even remember, I think it was Enterprise. And at that time, I didn't have a suit. So I had like khakis and like a blazer that I got from like FBLA when I was in high school. And I thought I was clean, you know. So I, was, I had my resumes printed out. I had like a little, I went to the UAPB store and got like a little binder and had my little stuff all together. And I showed up for the interview and I was like, hey, Mr. Chair, I'm ready to go. She was like, you can't interview. And I was like, why not? She was like, you don't have a full suit. And I was like, but I mean, I have a blazer, and I mean, I'm, I'm good to go. Like, I, like the pictures on Facebook, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> and it was one of those scenarios where, at that moment, I realized that, hey, this is, this is serious. Like, Miss Cherry understood that my appearance, before I even opened my mouth, that that employer was probably already thinking about the next person. And it's that type, those type of insights and strategies from the people that you can get, that the information that you can get from people today, because there, there is a game plan that you have to have at this game called success, right? And everybody's path is different. And here's an opportunity for you to get information from people who can, you know, one, help you eliminate a failure. Um, they can share information with you. They can give you a, a different strategy to where it could possibly eliminate a step. But at the end of the day, it's all about really taking a sit, a sit back and understanding what you're passionate about, what you truly love, and what type of impact you want to make in this, in this world. Because no matter how much money you make, if you don't truly enjoy what you do, those challenges, those arguments, those people that you work around, they're not always going to be your best friend. But if you truly enjoy what you do and you've done your research, to say, hey, I'm in the right field and I'm doing uh, what I'm passionate about, those challenges, those, those hard days, I mean, you'll be able to overcome that. And the last thing I want to leave you with as a student, be comfortable with competing. Understand at the end of the day, hard work and dedication will put you ahead of anybody, no matter what that piece of paper states as far as what school they attended. And I've been in scenarios where I've, I've worked against people from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and the information that I've gained here, I was able to teach them. Because there's so much that you can learn from a book. But if you don't have people that help you to apply that to real world scenarios, it's worthless information. And UAPB gives you realistic concepts to how you can apply what you learned here today and through your education at UAPB, if you put forth the effort, because everything else is it, it it deter determined on your effort, you will be successful. So at the end of the day, it's on you. The consultants, we made our investment to be here, but I hope that you would really take advantage of this opportunity as students to make major moves. Thank you.
Dr. Giles, you'll be our next speaker and <laughs> following Joseph. <laughs> okay. Well, one thing, um, you know, one thing I can say about Joseph, you know, a lot of times when you're working with students, but Joseph never got offended and he just took action on what I told him to do. And uh, I'm so glad to have him here today because uh, he was one of mine. And uh, on his first uh, YMTF, he followed this man so. The man told, came in there and told me, he said, I told him, I said, I'll be right back. I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Joseph was on him. And you know, making jokes. And he sat in that conference room and he told me, he said, that young man is going to be something someday. And he said, I don't have a position, but I guarantee I'm going to make a position for Joseph when I get back. And he did. He went to BLM. He was fighting fires. But that was his first internship as a freshman. And he did an excellent job. So he's back here today. This was his dream, to be back with YMTF. At this time, uh, I would like to recognize some consultants. Now, I know Felisa has been with the program longer than I have. <laughs> but today, what we did, we went back 10 years because we're celebrating 45 years. And I want to recognize those consultants that have basically been here 10 consecutive years. And that is amazing. And the first one, and this is the first year that Kevin Blakely has not been with us. He has been committed to this program. He worked very hard for this program. And we really do miss him. But Kevin Blakely has been with us 10 or more years. And I do have a certificate for him. The next one is for Lois Bowers. <laughs> uh, I remember when I was a, uh, I guess you call a career coach, or, and she came to the office and said, I want to give back to my university. And I believe at that time she was with Kellogg. And uh, that was the beginning of something great for us because not only her presence, but also sponsorships throughout the years. So thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ruth Jones. <laughs> Another great asset to the program. And by the way, they are also uh, committee members that help put all this together. And I appreciate your dedication for 10 years or more for this program. Thank you so much. Felisa Kennedy. So what she say, 26 years, y'all. Y'all can clap better than that. And you will see her in action in the classroom. She has no fear <laughs> of approaching anything. <laughs> Thank you so much. She has been dedicated, works very hard for YMTF. This next person is my best friend. Ricky Peer. <laughs> We're so thankful for what you have done for the program. And I know you're getting ready to retire, but you'll still be with YMTF. So we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for the interns that we have there right now. <laughs> OK, is that it? Oh. And in the absence of Felicia Collins Wiley, she could not be with us uh, this year, I think for the past couple of years, but she has been with the program, a sponsor of this program, and we do miss her, but we want to recognize her as well. Okay, I think um, Bobby is not here, and I, I want to recognize Bobby, I thought, that we had done that, but I found out that we didn't. I guess sometimes when you think you're friends, you've done something, but you haven't done it. But 
Bobby has been very instrumental uh, in keeping our program going for the last couple of years. Uh, she went to work for Mercedes Benz, and the first thing that she did was invest in YMTF. So she has been a platinum sponsor for the last couple of years, and I really want to recognize her. And, and not only that, she invests her own personal money for gift cards, a thousand dollars worth of gift cards to the students for the last two to three years. So we, she's gone because her sister's not feeling well, so she went back to the hotel. But let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and I do have uh, something for her when she returns. Uh, we'll give it to her tomorrow. But I am so, you know, that there again, it's about relationships. Relationships. Because we have been friends, I guess, for 30 years or more. And uh, the first thing that she did, I am putting, she said, I'm going to put YMTF in my budget. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So you all just heard Ms. Cherry acknowledge uh, one of the supporters of the program. So I have the pleasure of acknowledging all of the supporters of the program, because without our supporters, this program definitely would not be possible. You've heard from Dr. Roof, Mr. Meyer, Joseph, uh, Dr. Willis, about how impactful this program is for the students. So I really want to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge those companies that support us, because as I said, without you guys and your support, this program would not be possible. So as I call the name of the company, and it's been circulating on the screen all night, but as I call the name of the company, if there is a representative from that company here, would you please stand for me? Uh, our platinum sponsor, Mercedes-Benz Financial Services, and that is Miss Bobby Sweat, which Miss Cherry just told us had to leave. Our silver sponsor, Enterprise Rental Car. Our bronze sponsor, uh, Monsanto. Willis Family Dentistry, <laughs> then we have our individual supporters. We have uh, Ms. Bobby Sweat, <laughs> Ms. Kamisha Freeman, and Kamisha every year has provided the business cards for our students every year for the last two, two or three years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we really appreciate that. And we found that the students really appreciate those business cards because they ask us, oh, can we get some more business cards? Y'all got some more business cards? So we definitely appreciate you. And then we have uh, Ameriprise Financial Services, Mr. John Ekanawi. <laughs> and Mr. Lester Matlock. Thank you. If you will look uh, under your centerpiece, there is a, uh, some programs. We're going to ask, um, well, I'll say that when we get to it, see if we can get through this, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. There's no way we could end this evening without honoring, remembering, and celebrating the life of Malcolm Mathis. For me, not one day has gone by that Malcolm and his family has not crossed my mind and in my heart and prayers. I met Malcolm in his freshman year at my church and had further opportunities to spend time with him by picking him up for church and taking him out to dinner on several occasions. The first day I met Malcolm, I told him about career services. He came to sign up 
the very next week. And he stayed connected to career services until he graduated. There were several things about his character that stood out. He was so mature for a freshman. He was very respectful, well-mannered, intelligent, dependable, trustworthy, and focused. Malcolm's presence will be with us throughout this week because even though he knew he would not be here this year, he still added so much value to the committee and the program. He understood what it means to make a commitment. He was determined to do his part in the planning was committed to completing his task. In fact, at 5.49 p.m. on that Thursday, he emailed Bobby Sweat to see if the classroom activities were complete. He touched every aspect of YMTF, from the networking cards the students used this evening, the classroom activities, and the keynote speaker for the assembly. He, was accept, he accepted the position of co-chair and his contribution this year is worthy for YMTF 45 to be dedicated in his memory. In closing, even though Malcolm only had, only lived 33 years, he touched many lives and left a legacy for us to follow. I found these words in a poem entitled, Live a Life That Matters, that describes Malcolm and the life that he lived. I would like to share this with you because it also answers the question, what are we here for? I'm only sharing a portion of it. So what will matter? What will matter is not your success, but your significance. What will matter is not what you learned, but what you taught. What will matter is every act of integrity, compassion, courage, or sacrifice that enriched, empowered, or encouraged others to emulate your example. What will matter is not your competence, but your character. What will matter is not how many people you knew, but how many people will feel a lasting loss when you're gone. What will matter is not your memories, but the memories that live own in those who loved you. What will matter is how long will you be, be remembered and for what? Living a life that matters doesn't happen by accident. It happens by choice. And Malcolm made that choice. At this time, we have a representative from Monsanto, Dr. Golden, and he's going to come and share a few words with us. Immediately following him, we have uh, Bloomfield, Mr. Bloomfield. Thank you, Ms. Chair. I uh, can recall exactly where I was when I heard the news that we had lost. Malcolm Mathis, uh, remarkable young man. I work for Monsanto. I live here in Pine Bluff. Um, I work in our HR group. I work on outreach. Um, and from time to time, I would have groups in St. Louis. And when you wanted a young brother to come in and explain to people opportunities in agriculture and IT, Malcolm was my go-to guy. And I thought I had really found a jewel, come to find out the company was aware, highly aware of the impact that Malcolm had on people. His demeanor, 
his consciousness, his attitude was always consistent. In fact, you know, when we lose someone, a lot of times we don't share the details. I can share with you that as a result of Malcolm trying to assist, trying to help in his own way, he, he died tragically. And, uh, and, and it's unfortunate, but he made a remarkable impact. Uh, Malcolm was very active. At Monsanto, we're, Joseph, you know you spent some time with the company. We're a pretty good sized company, about 20,000 people across the, across the world. Um, we have these different networks. We have one called African Americans in Monsanto. It's a business resource group where the black employees of the company can come together and help each other. Uh, th those of us that are in the lat latter stages of our career kind of reach back and mentor those that are coming in. And Malcolm was kind of in the middle. He could, he could reach back and help the young ones coming in, but he was also far enough along to help those of us with a little gray hair uh, improve our game because of, once again, his demeanor his attitude and his willingness. He loved UAPB. Uh, he and I had recruited here together. Uh, we'd been on campus together for different events. And uh, this is one of those times, Miss, Miss Cherry, when uh, I think I'll reflect back and say that, you know, I'm glad I had a little time to spend with him. I don't envision that we'll be able to replace a Malcolm Mathis. He was just that rare an individual. So uh, I share with you, I just wanted to share those words with, with you. Um, I think we've shared with you the, the, the services, the arrangements. Uh, Friday will be the wake in St. Louis, and then Saturday I will get, make sure you have those details so that those of you that want to you know, participate, yeah, I'll make sure that that happens. Uh, but on behalf of Monsanto, and especially the African American, African American and Monsanto Business Network, we just want to share with you that we feel your pain, we share your loss, we'll continue to pray for the family and for the UEPB family. Thank you, Ms. Jerry. Good evening. Good evening. So, um, I met Malcolm 14 years ago. He was my line brother. We played the Alpha together. And I first met him after our informational, we got chosen, you know, we're introducing ourselves to each other. And I was like, um, so he's like, you in sports? I was like, yeah. I run track. What do you do? He said, I play ball. I said, for real? What do you play? Um, wide receiver? Tight ends? And no, tennis. I mean, get out of here. Tennis ain't a real sport. <laughs> so, got to arguing about that. We've been arguing ever since. Me and Malcolm has got ourselves into a tradition. We speak every Friday from like 9 to 10. And I didn't realize it until he died because this past Friday, my phone didn't ring. And then I realized I couldn't call him. And so I didn't, even, I didn't even realize it was just his drive time and my downtime. I keep my, skip, my Fridays light. It's just something that I do. And so we always talk on a Friday. But one good thing, last December, one of our other line brothers was graduating with his master's. And we decided that we was going to go to his graduation in Florida. So Malcolm suggested that we fly. I was like, no. I don't want to fly, I want to drive. He said, because you're a cheapskate. I was like, no, I'm frugal. I said, you drive here from St. Louis in Park, and I'll drive my car. He's like, all right, yeah, you put the miles on your car. I ain't putting them on mine. I was like, okay, Malcolm, we're going to drive. And so we drove for 12 hours to Florida. When I tell you those were some of the best conversations ever, and it was so good that we drove because we spent that time. You know, um, we talked about death when we was in Alabama. We were driving, a truck cut over on us, and I kind of like backed off a little and I let him get over. I said, man, what if we had just died? You think you're the way to heaven? He said, I better. <laughs> I said, me too. You know? And I, then I started talking to him about, I said, uh, so are you ready to die? Saying, well, I'm not really ready to die, but I'm prepared. If I do die, my family should be okay, you know. And so, you know, we had that conversation. It's a tough conversation to have, but we have it. And that's when I found out that Malcolm hates GoFundMe's. You know, he don't like GoFundMe's. He's like, well, why buy a Jordan for two hundred dollars, and then when you die, your family has to have a fish fry. He says, use that money 
and put ten dollars down and get you an insurance policy. You know? And so I was like, man, that makes a lot of sense. I said, you need to post that on Facebook. He said, nah, you're not gonna get me cussed out. <laughs> it was just a good drive. I am really happy that I had, had the time just to spend that time with them. We got to the hotel and the guy was like, man, this hotel is booked. Uh, we only got one bed. And Malcolm was like, well, man said there's a pull-out chair. I was like, well, maybe we could try another hotel. So there was like, all the hotels are booked. He was like, well, Dress me LBs, we sleep head and tail. I said, no, nah, because you mistake me for Susan, I'm going to forget you my LBs. <laughs> so I made me a pallet, and that's what we did. Is you on the bed? I'm on the ground. I said, no, nah, I don't trust you like that. But Malcolm was a good person, man. He was real good. He had that same laugh, it don't matter what you. I, I hung up on Malcolm at least five or six times a month, <laughs> at least. Because he, he'd do that, he'll call me just to irritate me. And I'll just, I, it's the first thing he says, and I'll just click him, hang up. <laughs> then he'll call me right back. But that's just what's how, we, that's how we are, and he always laughed. I have never heard Malcolm curse. And I said, that is a leaf I'm gonna take out of his book. You know, I have never heard him curse. And I was like, it doesn't matter what. I've never seen him mad, and I've never seen him curse. And so I told my wife, I said, you know what? To honor Malcolm, I'm going to take that leaf out of his book, and I won't curse no more. But, because I was driving up here, and he's speaking on the other side, I'm going to start over tomorrow. <laughs> I'm trying to pass him. I was trying. So, Malcolm, I, I'm not sad because I just had a lot of time with him. You know, it was tragic how it ended for him. He didn't deserve that. He was a good person. But when you think about what he went through, I told his wife, I says, you know, Job lost everything just like you did. And I said, you might not want to hear it right now, but in due season, you will see that God gave Job double for his trouble. And Job is better than you, and it's the same God. And so eventually, in due season, you will get double for your trouble. Right? Thank you. Can we share share a moment of silence together in memory of of Malcolm? Father, we love you and we thank you that even now you are truly the God of all grace. Even in the midst of difficult times, you are still with us. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. And we thank you that we can stand on the promises of your word. We thank you, Lord. Uh, pray for the Mathis family. We pray, Lord, that even now that you would place them in the hollow of your hand. And that you would give them the comfort, the strength, and the peace that they need during this very difficult time. Pray that you would give them the provision and the protection that they need even while Malcolm is gone. And we pray that they will live lives, that we all, will all live lives that honor his memory for days, months, and years to come. We love you, Lord, and we thank you even now for your hand that we know is with them today and always. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Are there any more com any other comments from the floor? If not, uh, any announcements? 7, 8, 7 a.m. in the morning here at the... STEM Conference Center. You're right. And on time is 
15 minutes early. 15 minutes early. <laughs> so we'll see you at 6.45 in the morning. Mr. Lafayette. <laughs>